You're listening to The Jam Fry Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is director Brent Wilson. And we're going to be talking about his new documentary, Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road, No Relation. Uh, and I have to tell you, this uh, documentary brought tears to my eyes, uh, Brent. It really, really is... Um, it's very, very fascinating and very, yeah, it's really fascinating. I don't know if you remember though, you've been on my show before. Of course I remember. <laughs> I absolutely remember. And I'm thrilled to be back. I, your Streetlight Harmonies interview was wonderful. Um, and this is where all this began. You were so kind to us about uh, Streetlight Harmonies and uh, my previous documentary and about doo music. And uh, we had a lovely time and uh, Brian actually appears in that film and that's kind of how all this began. So there's a very direct thin line, Jan, between it, all it of all go, It all goes around, right? <laughs> the six degrees <laughs> of separation. Yes, we met, um, yeah, at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it was. So it was, and I think um, we were kind of talking offline. You asked about what I was up to and I told you we were starting to work on this uh, Brian Wilson doc. We were just is kind of getting started and so yeah it's wonderful to be back here talking to you that means that tells me that we got it done <laughs> <laughs> well it's great i'm grateful to have you back on the show and this is a wonderful documentary um it truly it's so different and unique in the way that you put it together and um and and just gives us a really um you know, just that wonderful inner view of, of Brian Wilson, who is, can be an enigma, an enigma. Um, certainly we have the movie um, Love and Mercy about him, which I thought was a wonderful film, but um, this certainly is truly him talking. So tell us a little bit about how this, how you decided to do this film and how it came about. Sure, sure. And, and you're right. First of all, I think and you're, there, there has been a lot of really great projects on Brian already. Love and Mercy was just a beautiful film. Uh, Bill Polad's movie it was just stunning. Don Waz had made a beautiful documentary in the 90s, David Leaf. So there already been quite a bit done on Brian. But I think Brian is just one of those personalities that you could never, ever truly capture in one project or two project. I mean, it would be like, you know, what if there was only one documentary on, uh, you know, George Washington <laughs> or, right. uh, you know, it's- Or Lincoln. Or Lincoln, yes, yeah. exactly. Or, you know, what if there was only one book on Mozart? I, you know, I think Brian is, is, is of that category and you could never truly tell his story in, in one film. So after seeing Love and Mercy, um, and then we did, uh, Brian appears in Street Light Harmonies, which is how we had met. And um, he talks a little bit about in that, about doo-wop music, his influence, the influence doo-wop music had on him for Street Light. And um, we got to be good friends with his manager. And, and I did, I had felt there was still something there to be told in Brian's life, particularly, I think, in these last 10 years or so, um, you know, almost kind of where love and mercy leaves off. Mm -hmm. If you recall the end of love and mercy, you know, he, um, uh, he gets back with Melinda and they're, you know, they're going to get married and, and kind of begin their life. But since that moment, you know, Brian's adopted several children. Um, he has toured nonstop. Um, he's released several great albums. And so he was really doing things at 75 that he was afraid to do at 25. And, and I found that really intriguing. I thought, you know, here was a man at 25 years old who couldn't commit to a family, who couldn't commit to a life beyond the, the, the pain that was in his, in, his, in his head. And he couldn't tour, he couldn't enjoy this audience reactions that the band made, that his bandmates were receiving, performing his songs. And yet here he was at 75 now with the courage and the ability to be able to do that. And I thought, that's a story I want to tell. And so we just reconnected with Brian's management, uh, pitched them our, our idea. Um, they said yes. And uh, yeah, and of course, I make it sound really simple, but it's always never that simple. But <laughs> <laughs> No, never is. You know, I think there's something about when you get older, you become fearless. I think, you know, you, you figure 
who cares what happens, you know, <laughs> you know, just go for it, just do it and, and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And I think perhaps that's, you know, maybe where he is and his life and certainly his relationship with Melinda um, certainly has given him a lot of strength and, and whatnot. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, in doing the research, I, there was a connection with your father and, and, and your first introduction to the Beach Boys and their music. Do you mind telling that story? Oh, sure, sure. No, absolutely. I guess you get a cold chill. So, <laughs> 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 so if you see the hair standing up, that's uh, that's what it is. It's not cold in here. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I, I was nine years old, uh, my father passed away and my, my parents had divorced and um, we went and, you know, got all of his things out of his house that, you know, you have to do and brought everything back to our house. And I was I don't know, subconsciously trying to kind of discover who my father was uh, at that age. And um, I was going through his record collection. I was just kind of flipping through all of his records. And um, I came across uh, an album that um, had a really cool cover with some guys standing around like in really cool blue jackets standing in front of a Corvette Stingray. And I was like, well, I don't know who this is, but this looks really cool. <laughs> and um, so I, I put the album on and I, and I played it. And the very first song um, that came out is a song that Brian wrote called Shut Down. And um, the, the lyrics are, I won't sing it, uh, but the lyrics are, tack it up, tack it up, Buddy's going to shut you down. And my father's name was Buddy. Uh -huh. And so I instantly just thought, oh, my God, these guys are singing about my father. Because my father was also kind of a weekend drag racer. You know, he was uh, he was kind of Milner from American or from uh, American Graffiti. If you remember that movie, he was uh -huh. that guy. And um, so from then on, yeah, the Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys have been a part of my life. And uh, I saw them in concert that summer, that same summer, nine years old. My aunt took me to see them and I had the best time. And I, you know, was telling everybody in high school, you know, in the 1980s when, you know, being a Beach Boys fan wasn't cool, that this is the one of the greatest bands in the world and everybody else is listening to the Rolling Stones I was listening to the Beach Boys, and so they have always been a part of my life, and, and Brian has always been a thread. Um, I proposed to my wife using the lyrics from Wouldn't It Be Nice oh. uh, um, just a few <laughs> years ago, and um, that was one of the reasons we met was the, through her love of that song as well. So it's a true, true blessing and a true mm -hmm. honor to be even just a small thread in Brian's story. Wow, that's that's amazing. It really is amazing. I I had the honor of meeting Al Jardine. Actually, sat with him at a luncheon a number of years ago, and his wife Marianne. And um, I told him then, and uh, the reason I'm in California is because of the Beach Boys. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast in New Jersey, actually, and uh, the New Jersey Shore. Um, but I always wanted to be in California and be a California girl. And, uh, and eventually, uh, later on in life, I arrived here, but uh, you know, I had to go get the convertible and uh, grow my hair longer and <laughs> get that whole look going anyhow. But uh, they have influenced so many of us through the years, so many of us. I can't imagine how many people have your story. I mean, I think Brian, Al, and, and the Beach Boys are probably responsible for half of the population boom of LA in the 60s. Probably. I mean, you know, there's that song that Brian wrote um, uh, for Jan and Dean, uh, Surf City, you know, mm -hmm. and the first line is two girls for every boy. Oh, what guy doesn't want to go there? <laughs> You know, it's right. like, the sun's always out. Everybody's beautiful. You know, girls are on the beach. It's just, yeah, I absolutely can imagine that he's responsible for 50% of the population boom. <laughs> I agree. I think everybody wanted to come to California. Uh, that and then also to San Francisco for the, you know, <laughs> the hippie movement during the 60s. Exactly. Yes, both, yeah. You know, LA and uh, San Francisco covered for sure. Well, let's absolutely. talk about the, the way that you did this film because you you did it in a very unique way and, um, and, and explain why you did it the way that you did. Um, and, and and talk about Jason Fine and uh, his relationship with Brian and, and yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, no, it's there, there wouldn't be a film without Jason Fine. It's um, uh, if uh, it, it just became a, an absolute blessing to, to be able to work with Jason. And, and what had happened was I had, you know, 
you know, I wish I could, uh, you know, say that I had this original idea, you know, this crazy idea from the very beginning, but I didn't. I was going to do a traditional doc. I thought that I could create an environment where Brian could kind of feel safe and interviewing. And, um, and you kind of see in the beginning of the film, you get just a little, I give like a little taste of that at the very beginning of the film where Brian sits down at the piano and I try to ask him a question and, you know, Brian gives me the best answer he can, but Brian hates interviews. He just does not like to be interviewed. And, um, you know, you can see it on any YouTube clip. You can kind of see it on any, any talk show. He's just not comfortable um under the lights and uh with the camera on him and a microphone he's it's just not something he's, he's comfortable with so i tried failed miserably thought my career was over um this is it and i'll never work again and uh gene sievers uh, brian's manager suggested that i reach out to jason uh who's the editor of rolling stone at the time and said that brian and jason had been friends for 20 years and jason had been had been writing about brian but they, but they're more than just writer and subject. They were friends, and they are friends. So I, I reached out to Jason, and we set up a phone call. Uh, my producer and I, Teresa, and right before the phone call, I read an article that Jason had written called "Brian Wilson's Better Days," and for Rolling Stone, beautiful article came out about I don't know, seven years ago. And in that article, Jason talks about cruising around L.A with Brian and they go get sushi, they go see the movie, The Wrecking Crew, they even went and got like a massage, <laughs> a massage place. And, and they're just kind of hanging out and having beers. And I thought to myself, you know, that's the movie I want to make. That's the movie I want to see as a fan. And so Jason at the end of the phone call made the mistake of saying, well, you know, this sounds like a great project. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. And, uh, you know, kind of screwed up with that one because I said, well, Jason, I've actually got this crazy idea. I said, what if we recreate that article in some way? Let's put you in a car with Brian. We'll rig up the car with cameras in it and microphones in it so that Brian doesn't have to wear a microphone. There's no cameraman. And it's just you and Brian driving around LA, visiting the places that are important to Brian in his life. And you know, let's let that be the thread of the film. And Jason was hesitant at first. Um, you know, he said, you know, look, he goes, these articles, you know, I'll spend sometimes weeks getting these articles because sometimes Brian can go an hour or two hours and not even say a word. And he goes, but I, of course, I don't ever press him or push him. And I think that's the secret to the relationship is, is that Jason never infringes upon Brian. And he goes, so, you know, we could be driving in that car for two hours and you're not going to get anything. And I was like, look, you know, the old adage just tape is cheap. So I was like, let's give it a try and see what happens. So Jason flew out from New York. We rigged up this car with three cameras, um, uh, but we wanted high definition cameras and uh, high end cameras with nice lenses. So that would look cinematic. I uh, didn't want it to look like carpool karaoke. And that's certainly no knock on that show, but Carpool karaoke is only five, six minutes long. Um, you know, I needed to be able to hold the audience's attention for, you know, an hour and a half. And Jan, you know, we gave it a try. And within 10 minutes, Brian, before we even left Brian's neighborhood, he starts talking and opening up. And I'm in this follow car listening behind. And I, and I within 10 minutes, knew this was going to work. And I just needed to have the um, the faith, I guess, and the, the confidence that the audience would accept this unusual format, and and that's you know that's what's that was the leap of faith I think at that point was you know could and would audiences come along for this ride? They certainly will, for sure. Uh, it is it, it it's just more realistic. I've been sitting, you know, I, I loved it actually, you know, and all the different places they went to that were important or are important to Brian and his his uh, life. Um, I thought that was really interesting and uh, very touching too. Um, when Jason, when he picked all the music too, talk about that. Talk about that process and choosing the music and, sure, and what sure. that was about. One of the things that 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 we did in the film that I and one of the things that I love about Brian is that Brian loves his own music. He really likes his own music, which I think is something 
something that at least in my experience is kind of unusual for artists. Like I don't like to watch my films after they're done. It's like, I don't want to see them. You know, and you hear that with actors like, oh, I made this movie and I've never seen it. And, or I watched it once and I've never watched it again. Or uh, Stephen King says he's never read one of his books, you know? So I think it's, there's, there's my, this perception that artists don't like, you know, their own material. Brian loves his own music. He likes his songs. He's proud of his music. And I think it brings him good memories. Um, so we loaded up uh, an iPhone just full of every Brian Wilson Beach Boy song. Um, and, you know, we put it in the car and when Brian wanted want to hear a song, you know, Jason would, you know, very delicately <laughs> while driving with these cameras on the dashboard, driving California's most precious cargo try on the 405, which is, you know, it's its own <laughs> nightmare. Right. Um, try to find these songs that Brian would ask for. And um, that's where the title comes from. Um, he's, he just kind of kept asking for Long Promise Road um, over and over again. Um, it's Okay, which is kind of a, a rare uh, a Beach Boys song that he uses as a mantra. And so, yeah, he would just kind of, you know, hey, Jason, do you have, you know, the night was so young and Jason would pull it up. So what's really neat about the film is that Brian, you know, for all intents and purposes, narrates the film and uh, provides the soundtrack you know, to his own movie. And that's, as a fan, that's really cool. It, I love it's, that. It's very cool. It's very unique, different, and very cool. And very touching when when he, one of the songs, and I can't remember which one, and it was co-written with a friend of his. Yes, yeah, Long Promise Road, um, Jack oh, Riley. Okay, uh, yeah. Yep, yeah, that's a, our title track. And right. um, it was a song that, he did. He, he he kept asking for it. And it's interesting because it's not a song that's really associated very much with Brian. Brian's oh. brother, Carl, uh, wrote the song with Jack Riley, um, who was the manager of the Beach Boys at the time. And uh, Brian wrote on it um, and has a writing credit and sings on it, sings backgrounds on it. But it's not his song. Right. It's not. It was mainly Carl's and Jack's song. Um, but he just loves the song. He loves, he's so proud of his brother, Carl, that, you know, he talks about in the film and, and him stepping up as a producer. And, and, um, so he asked to hear the song once and, um, they're playing it and, and Jason just kind of, you know, mentions to him that the Jack Rally, who was the co-writer of the song and, and the Beach Boys manager in the seventies had passed away. And Jason had thought that Brian knew because it had happened to, you know, several years ago and, and Brian didn't know. And um, so we capture that moment and you, you see that moment and you see the, uh, the pain on his face and, and you see the hurt. And um, it, was, it was difficult to watch and, and it was difficult to even include in the film. Um, I was really torn about whether or not to even use it. Um, Jason and I had some conversations, but ultimately we decided that, you know, this is, this is what it's like for Brian every day. You know, the, the goal of the film was to walk a mile in Brian's shoes. And, you know, this is what it's like for this guy every day. His emotions are so real and they're so raw. And I think that's why he's such an amazing songwriter is I think his, his ability to connect with emotions is it's at a next level. It's, it's beyond my level. You know, I can see a photograph and connect with emotion, but he'll connect at a different level or he'll hear a song and, and it's deeper for him. And it's, and I think that's one of the reasons why he's either very happy or very sad. And because he does, he just on a, his emotions are just that much more raw. So that was just one of those moments where after some debate we did, we thought, you know, we owed it to the audience and we owed it for them to understand what it's like to, to be with Brian. Um, and, and that moment is, is very touchy and it is, um, and afterwards, Jason collapsed in my arms and goes, oh, my God, I thought he knew. <laughs> Jason felt terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, like, it, I thought he knew. <laughs> but it, it's so real. And you're right. So raw and, um, and genuine. So I think it was I'm glad you included it into the, in the film. I really do. I mean, I, I started crying, too, watching it. Uh, you know, it, it, it's very touching. Watching him. I mean, so many creative geniuses. Uh, suffer from depression and you know manic depression or whatever because I think because they can't really it's hard for them they're on such a different plane than many other people 
I, I just believe that they have a harder time dealing with the reality of life, the mundane, the everydayness of life. And so, um, and that's what creates, you know, they're feeling the highs and the lows um, that they go through. Um, and I, I related to this because my father, um, he died young, but uh, Brian looks like my father. You know, what my father might have looked like if he had lived longer, he died at 56, but he's the same kind of hairstyle as my dad. And my dad did suffer from um, depression, manic depression. So it, I just really related to this. I didn't have any idea that I was going to relate on such a different, a deep level. So it's sort of like you with your father's story. Um, this also, you know, again, was, um, you know, personal, personal for me in watching it. So mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, I'm so sorry to I'm sorry to hear that and and but I but I do I, I think you're right I think that half of Brian's story um, is is a story of mental health mm -hmm. and um, you know half of the story is music you know it's fifty percent of his life but the other fifty percent is now mental health and and his courage to be open about his mental health and to deal with his mental health. Uh, on a daily basis. And, you know, it takes a lot of guts for him to get out of bed every day. And it takes a lot of guts for him to get out on that stage. And it, it's, his story is, is a story of mental health. And it was a, a I, we screened it at Tribeca and, uh, and then at Nashville, at the Nashville Film Festival and the Tribeca Film Festival. And I, I would say the, the people that would come up to me, I'd say, 90% of the times, 10% of the time would be like, you know, oh my gosh, I loved Brian Wilson. I love Brian Wilson's music. His music has been the soundtrack of my life. That was maybe 10% of the people. I'd say 90% of the people that came up and a lot of people came up and, and were moved by the film, which, which meant so much to us, but they would come up and say, you know, I didn't know much about Brian Wilson or his music, but I know his story about mental health. And I know this person in my family, or I have mental health issues, and that gives me strength. And that's been uh, some of the greatest responses uh, I've, I've heard about the film. And, and one of the most, I think, just beautiful attributes of Brian's life is that people, I think, are inspired by Brian. If Brian Wilson can get out of bed, why can't I? And if Brian Wilson can go out on stage and do that why can't i go to work and there's and and that's not the answer of course it's mental health is a very complicated issue but it certainly is a beautiful first step right and um and brian i think provides that to people is um it, his life is miraculous. i think elton john says it. he goes he doesn't just deserve the accolades for the music he does, deserves the accolades for how he's lived his life and I think that's 100% right. I agree. I agree. And I've, I've said through the years that, you know, mental illness is just treated so differently than if we if we found out somebody had cancer. Oh, well, we would give them all kinds of sympathy. But, you know, mental illness does not get the same kind of uh, sympathy or, you know, people look at it very, very differently. Um, my, my father died of a heart attack. It had nothing to do with the manic depression. We got that under control, thank heavens. But, you know, it's it's still a hard thing. And I know many people who do suffer from it. So it's a very important thing. You, but by the way, you won a grand jury prize at the Nashville Film Festival. We did, we did. Yeah, That's thank exciting. you very much. Thank you. Yep, yep. Yeah. It was wonderful. We had a great time down there. There, It's a beautiful city, lovely hosts. Oh, yes. Uh, my, my brother lives in Nashville, my brother and sister-in-law. And I, you know, went there for my niece's wedding. I love Nashville. It's a great town. Just a great town to have a good time in, isn't it? Great yes. food. <laughs> yeah. Very good time. And I understand that you are, um, there's going to be an Oscar campaign uh, for best original song for the song Right Where I Belong, which is a new song that Brian wrote for this film. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, he wrote uh, wrote it um, and wrote it, co-wrote it and co-produced it with Jim James of My Morning Jacket. Um, Brian wrote this beautiful melody um, that that he had, and we were we were making the film, and, and I knew we wanted um, some original music in the film. I wanted to see Brian in the studio. That was part of my original vision. I wanted to show the audience this is what it's like to watch Brian make music, and I wanted the audience to see that. But uh, right during filming, Brian had back surgery. 
And we had to shut down for about nine months uh, because of this back surgery that he had. And, you know, back surgery, of course, no joke. And it's such a, a difficult thing to recover from. And particularly if you're in your 70s and, and Brian had a really tough time with it. And we went into the studio after that point and Brian recorded a bunch of great new music um, that we're really excited is going to be able to get out. But he had this one beautiful melody that he wrote. Um, and but he was in a lot of pain, Jan. He was still in tremendous amount of pain from from his back. And come to find out a day or two after we finished in the studio, he went back um, to see his doctor and they had to have a second back surgery. Um, and because he was having the back surgery, you know, the pain was causing a lot of mental issues because of the pain. Um, which is a pretty common thing. And uh, we learned and, you know, Brian talked about this. He canceled some shows. He had to cancel some tours and things like that. But he left us with this beautiful melody. And so I approached Jim James and That's Jim right. had Jim had sing on Long Promise Road uh, with Brian. And he goes, I, he goes, I'd be thrilled. So he um, uh, him and Brian collaborated together. And now we've got this amazing new song yeah. for the film. Great. And yeah. Uh, can't wait for people to hear it. Me too. I, I wish we had more time, but unfortunately we don't. Where can people see this film? Before we... Sure. Yep. We'll be in uh, select theaters starting November 17th, uh, all around the country. And then uh, on demand, uh, day and date, November 19th. So on all your usual video on demand and streaming platforms. Great. Everybody, even if, if you're a Beach Boys fan, Brian Wilson fan, please seek this out. Even if you're not, it, you're going to, you, it's, it's music that you should be aware of if you've never listened to it before and we'll give you a new perspective. So thank you, Brent, for being back on the show. I look forward to having you back on, when you have your next movie. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's make a date right now. The next movie is, yes, we, we have to keep this going. <laughs> yes, we do. We definitely do. Well, it's great to see you. If you have missed any of the Jam Price Shows All About Movies, you can go to my website, thejampriceshow.com, where all of my shows are archived. You can even listen probably to the interview I did with Brent several years ago. Uh, also, you can listen on your favorite podcast network, the iHeart Podcast Network, Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your uh, podcast. And also, you can find us at Twitter and at Instagram at The Jam Price Show. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>